prophet writes these words. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands with some of the articles of the house of God, which were carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God, little g. Then the king instructed Aspenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men, in whom there was no blemish, but good looking, gifted in all wisdom. How many say that's me? Just go ahead and say that's you. Say that's me. You can say that's me. Say that's me. Amen. And, and, and uh, in all wisdom, possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had the ability to serve the king's palace, and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies, of the wine that he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end, at that time, they might serve before the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, that is. Now from among those, the sons of Judah were, listen, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them, the chief of the eunuch gave names, gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach, and to Misael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. You still with me? Now, God had brought Daniel to the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink, for why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are of age or who are your age? Then you would endanger my head before the king. So Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Misael, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days. And let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. My, my. Then let our appearance be examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies. As you see fit, so deal with your servants. You're almost there. Two more verses. So he consented with them in this matter and he tested them for how long? Ten days. And at the end of ten days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh and all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. I want to speak to you this morning from the subject, the value of fasting and prayer. The value of fasting and prayer. Obviously, we're in a season of fasting, so it's appropriate for us to talk about this. I want to draw my text from verse 8 this morning, where the prophet says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself, with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Father, we thank you for your presence that's already here. Now give me wisdom. God, I humble myself. I ask that your Holy Spirit would quicken me. Father, touch the hearts of your people that their hearts would be open to receive your word. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. The value of fasting and prayer. As you know that for the past few weeks, we've been participating in a corporate fast. Where we've taken time to discipline our bodies and to get closer to God. How many of you all know that when you start telling your body to do certain things that it don't want to do, that it starts talking back to you? Amen. You need to say amen right there. Amen. We, we, we started the year out saying that the things that were a bondages and hindrances to us last year, we don't want that to be the case this year. And that we were willing to sacrifice some things, namely food, uh, maybe some time and some other things, so that we could live a life of complete victory. I believe one place in scripture says to be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Sometimes bondage will try to find you even though you left it somewhere else. So this morning I want to talk with you briefly about the value of fasting and prayer or the 
power of denying yourself. In this chapter of Daniel, I want to give you some background on this text that I read. I want to ask you to listen very closely. There are some nuggets here that I believe will be a blessing to you. It had actually been prophesied that Israel would be taken and held captive by the Babylonians for 70 years because of their disobedience. The text I read this morning picks up in Daniel chapter 1 where the fulfillment of this prophecy is now taking place. The chapter tells of four young Hebrew men who were captured by the Babylonians and were separated out to be servants of the Babylonian king. But their approach to the service of the king and how they prepared themselves stood out. It was different than the rest. It was unique from the rest of how the others uh, interacted. It was a different approach than the others took. I want to take a few moments this morning to describe these young men to you. You see, they were unique men, but they really were not much different than you and I. Verse 3 tells us that these young men were called out. They were separated out for service unto the king while they were yet living in a stressful and anxious time. How many know that God can still use you even when you're not facing the most favorable circumstances? Sometimes the time that God uses you the greatest is when things are going the worst for you. I was sharing with uh, some people this morning that uh, God often uses broken people to build broken people. Sometimes we think we have to be perfect and everything's got to be in order for God to effectively use us. But somebody should know this morning that while you may be broken, God can still use you to build other people. <laughs> Tells us that these young men were called out and separated even though they were living in a time of stress and anxiety. Uh, they were called out from among the Hebrew brethren who were also captured, but these four were separated for service unto the king. Now, I want you to stick with me here. Uh, it reminds me of a verse uh, in 2 Corinthians of 6.17 where he says, Paul says to the church of Corinth, he says, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. You see, sometimes separating yourself from the patterns of the world takes preparation. Sometimes separating yourself requires you to do some things that are not altogether pleasant. And we'll see in these verses that these young men prepared themselves for this unique time in their life. In verse 4, the Bible says that the young men in whom there was no blemish, that they were good looking. It says that they were healthy men and good looking men and intelligent men. They were chosen. Amen. Is anybody good looking, healthy, and intelligent? Come on, man. Y'all can raise your hand. You call yourself ugly or dumb, or you not much to speak well of yourself. My, my, my. Maybe I need to preach another sermon this morning. The Bible says that these were healthy men. They were good-looking men and intelligent men, and that they were chosen for service. But can I tell you that when I read verse 4, I can't help but to think about one word. That one word is the word favor. Amen. They were slaves captured by the Babylonians. They were living in a strange land that they would make their home for the next 70 years. They were in a broken place, a broken state in their lives. But yet it's still in that God favored them right where they are. Can I tell you that anybody that names the name of Christ, I don't care if you're in jail, in the hospital, in the streets, I don't care where you are, that God's favor is resting upon you. Just because of the Spirit of God that's in you. I realize that sometimes as Christians we uh, associate pain and trouble with a God having left us. But what I've learned is that even in my pain and my trouble, favor is still following me. Goodness and mercy has still got my back when the devil is trying to chase me down. Favor is following me because of the spirit of the living God that's inside of me. Uh, 1 Peter 2.9 says that you're a chosen generation. 
a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar, a, a different people that you should be called, uh, show forth the praises, his praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Yeah. We look at verse 5. I, I'm just giving you a background. I need you to listen closely here. The king appointed, listen, that they should be trained in eating the best food or delicacies, the best wine, and that they would give three years of training to prepare them for royal service. He got a three-year scholarship. All the rest of the guys had to go out and feed them. These four young men in particular were chosen from the Israelite slaves to serve in the king's courts. Now, their names were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The first thing the Babylonians did was to strip them of their identity. They gave them slave names. You know, the enemy is always trying to strip God's people of their identity. He's always trying to strip us of who God has called us. God has given us each a name, but the enemy is always desiring to give us a slave name, to put us back in bondage, the name that uh, people used to call you when you were walking the streets and when you were living uh, an ungodly life. But God has changed your name. The enemy oftentimes tries to call you by a different name. God calls you justified. The enemy calls you condemned. God calls you free. The enemy says you're bound. God says you're victorious. The enemy calls you a failure and defeated. God calls you the head. The enemy says you're always going to be the tail. God says, I'll see you through the eyes of a winner. The enemy says the only thing you do is mess up. He's always trying to change the identity of God's people. So the king changed their name. He, he said Daniel will be called Belteshazzar. Uh, Hananiah will be called Shadrach. And Mes Misael will be called Meshach, and Azariah will be called Abednego. Now, why is that significant this morning? Why is that significant? Because uh, these men's original names were names that were given to them by their own nation. Right. There was a nation that God had favored. They, 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 got, they got these names as a part of their relationship to the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. But more importantly, their names identified them with their God. Right. It expressed praise unto their God. Listen, if Satan can take your spiritual identity and cause you to see yourself through a lens that he creates for you instead of the lens that God created for you, he can take your identity and he can sure enough take your praise. Yeah. Daniel and Misael, their name contained a reference to the name El, E-L, which is the Hebrew name for God. And Hananiah and Azariah's name contained a reference to the word Yah, which is Y-A-H, also a Hebrew name for God. So the Babylonians said, I'm stripping everything away that looks like God. They tried to strip them of everything. In, in, in the name of uh, Belteshazzar, uh, Belteshazzar and Abednego, we see allusions to the Babylonian god named Bel and Nebo. He said, I'm taking your god's name off of you and putting my god's name on you. They tried to strip their identity from the god of Israel and replace it with the god of Babylon. Y'all with me? I'm just going to teach for a little bit. So what's significant about that is that Babylon in Scripture often represents the world. It represents worldliness. It represents evil. It represents everything that is opposite of godliness, which uh, tells us that the enemy is always trying to strip us of our appearance and the fragrance that God has placed upon us and replace us with the identity of the gods of this world. Amen. The God of lust. The God of immorality. The God of lies. The God of deception. The God of self-centeredness. The things that make, and bo make the body feel good but defy the laws of God. It has grieved me even that the church has in some ways said that we will keep the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob on one hand, but we will at the same time capitulate and bow to the God of the world. 
somehow the church at times has believed that you can both at the same time serve the God of Israel and the God of this world. We've taken the God of Israel and tried to conform and shape him into something that looks pleasurable to us. But how many know that the word of God says that he is a God that changes not. He is immutable. He is unchangeable. It doesn't matter what type of way the world tries to conform him. God says, I don't conform to you. You conform unto me. That's why we struggle oftentimes with our tongue and knowing when to speak and when to be quiet. And we struggle with our urges to do wrong things and desires to handle our business the way we want to handle it instead of the way that God wants to handle it. Because the enemy is always trying to strip you of the lordship of Jesus Christ in your life. Amen. There's a distinction between him being your God and him being your Lord. You see, a God is somebody that everybody can look to. Yeah. A God is somebody that's recognized by everyone. Even the demons in hell recognize that Jesus was God. Yeah. But Lord says to him, it says, I choose to uh, adopt your identity in place of my identity. I choose to put you as the head and the Lord of my life so that your will can be done and not mine. Yeah. These four young men. They see what is happening, and they choose not to indulge in the pleasures of the king's food. Then we see what happens in verses 8, where Daniel says, where I drew my text, Daniel said, I purposed in my heart that I would not defile myself. I won't partake with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he requested the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. I wonder if there's any more people in the church today who would say, I choose not to indulge. I choose not to defile myself with the cares and the things of this world. I choose not to be a part of what people are saying it's just the way life is, but I choose to live holy. You know what I've learned about uh, uh, th this age that we're living in is that this age we're living in is a religious age and a spiritual age, but it's not too much of a holy age. Yeah. There's a difference between being yes, religious and going to church and recognizing yes, and acknowledging God and saying that I'm a holy person, yes, a person is. that lives the way God has called me to live. Right. Holiness says at its very root that who I am is no longer important, Amen. but who God is yeah. is what matters. Yeah. We can be religious and try to introduce ourselves into religiosity and say, but well, this is just who I am and realize that we're missing holiness. That's right. Holiness says that I realize I'm not perfect, but I'm striving for God to do something in me. Daniel said, I'm going on a fast to ensure that while I live in Babylon, that I never conform to Babylon. While I live in this place, you can take my human name, but you can't strip the identity of God from me. What Daniel knew is that it is that he could not do that just by willing himself into it. But it took some self-denial where he had to bring the flesh under subjection to say, I may be in Babylon, but I'll never let Babylon get in me. He saw that they were in bondage. And he saw they were trying to strip his identity. He knew that the only way to retain any semblance of his connection with the God of Israel was to be different. Yeah. Yeah. He had to use a different approach. <laughs> he said, I'm going to fast. And I'm going to pray. Friends, can I tell you that today that we're living in a foreign land? Just like the Israelite young men were living. We're living in a world that does not care for the things of God. And will in fact inundate you with the things that are of the world and that are unholy. And because we are fleshly beings, hear me on this, please hear me this. And because we are fleshly beings, we have the natural tendency to shy away from anything that looks like God in order to become formed and shaped into what looks like the world. How many know that you have a natural tendency to be selfish? You have a natural tendency to lie. 
You have a not, I know you may not like that, but it's the truth. Nobody has to teach you how to sin. We all were born with a PhD in sin. We all had a tendency when we came out our mother's womb to do wrong instead of doing right. We all have got that tendency. And Daniel knew that unless I bring my flesh under subjection, the tendencies of this flesh will take over. See, when you're in Babylon, you begin to look at what Babylon looks like. And after a while, Babylon begins to look good to you. And some of the things that you know to be unholy begins to look holy all of a sudden. Can I tell you there's some things that even folk, church folk have made this self-believe is holy when in fact it is Babylon. That's why the scripture says there are going to be people who are going to stand before That's me at right. that day. And they're going to say, Lord, Lord, did not cast out yep. devils in your name. Did not preach and teach in your yep. name. And he's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. You thought that Babylon was the church and the church was... Babylon, but God said I'm still calling for a group of people who are not religious and are not spiritual, but are holy and understand the difference between allowing Babylon to become a part of the church. Daniel said, I'm in a foreign land. We don't have to be taught how to sin. It's a natural tendency. And I've learned that there are times when you yourself and I can lose my spiritual identity. You think it's not hard to drift away or to lose your identity, but there are times when it becomes easy to drift. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's in those times that we need to employ the tools that Daniel offers in fasting and prayer. Learn some things from these young men. I want to share a few and then I'm done. First of all, what we learn is that fasting puts us in a position to discipline ourselves to become more like Christ. Amen. One of the prayers that I've been praying lately is God make me more like you. As much as I would like to believe I'm like Christ, I have so much <laughs> further to go. We all do. And I'm praying constantly and I'm saying, God, please, please conform me into your image. Luke 9, 23, the writer says, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. And then he puts an operative word there daily, every single day, and follow me. How many of you all know this is a daily walk? Yeah. Every morning that you get up, you got a purpose in your heart that you're going to live for God today. Yeah. Somebody might have said or done something to you yesterday. You feel like getting up today and responding, but you got to bring your flesh under subjection today. I never take for granted when I wake up that I'm going to walk through my day and be super holy, but I pray at the beginning of my day, God, I don't know what I might face today. I don't know what I might see today. I don't know what some crazy idiot might say to me today, but I pray that you will give me the grace to live holy and to walk according to your perfect will. It's a daily walk. It's nothing that you do once and for all and then it's settled and it's finished. I know people were telling you that you give your heart to Christ and then after that you don't have to worry about it. But it's a day to day thing. And can I tell you and be honest with you for a moment, the fact is some days are better than others. Some days I don't get it the way I need to get it. And some days I have to go in my office at my job and close my door and, and sit at my desk and say, God, forgive me for flying off the handle like that. I should have been a little more patient than that. And that's when I pray and say, God, I need you to take me to the next step. Yes. Minute by minute. Yes. Moment by moment. It's a daily walk. The writer says, deny yourself and take up your cross every single day. Somebody say there's value in self-denial. Thank you. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't turn, turn, turn you into the office. Y'all probably like this. There's value in self-denial. Self-denial is the polar opposite of much of what we see in life today. Most areas of life today tell you and encourage you, don't deny yourself. 
In most cases, society teaches you, go ahead, pleasure yourself, do what makes you happy. You, you don't have to please anyone but yourself. In fact, society has gone so far as to teach us, um, first find what makes you happy, and then you conform right and wrong around that. Somebody ought to say amen to that. Can I tell you that when God created the world and Jesus walked this earth, that he did draw a box. There is a such thing as black and white in terms of right and wrong. He did draw a box and say, now I want you to be creative, but you cannot paint outside this box as it relates to how you live. Some people would tell you that you decide what makes you happy, and then you paint the lines around that. But I came to tell the church today that Jesus is the same today, yesterday, and forever. And what was wrong then is wrong now. We can't decide who we are as people and then say, now I'll create my boundaries. The boundaries were put in place for us. And God says, live within those boundaries. And I will make you abound in what I've given you. The world teaches us, don't deny yourself anything. Gratify yourself. You want it? Get it. If it feels good, do it. If you want to say it, say it. And, and I know I'm, 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 I'm saying this this morning, but it's a burden of mine. And God forbid, and you preachers in the house hear me today, God forbid that we ever preach a gospel that gives people permission to do what's outside of the box. We need to tell people that none of us are perfect and that we all were sinners on our way to hell. But when we give our hearts to Jesus Christ, behold, if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. There's not anything new. There's something wrong. If nothing has changed, there's something wrong. We have got to be people who live holy. No, I'm passionate this morning. It's a passion because Jesus is soon to return. He's coming back for a church that's real. Society says don't deny yourself. Do what makes you happy. Say what you want to say. What does it mean to be Christ-like? One of our greatest needs is to be daily conformed into the image of Christ. I'm going to hurry along here and finish. We, hit, we, 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 we read, we, we have to rid our hearts of these things. Uh, some of us have malice. There's, there's bitterness. There's jealousy and envy. What does it mean to be Christ-like? It means to rid your heart of deception and manipulation and procrastination and perfectionism and legalism and selfishness and a sense of entitlement and laziness and a spirit of worry and a negative and a critical spirit and arrogance and conceit and fear and anxiety and low self-esteem and low self-worth and constantly worrying about tomorrow instead of resting in the grace that he's given us for today and being overly assertive or being underly assertive and living to please people and to gain the acceptance of man and living to please no one except yourself. It's all of these things that hide themselves in the heart of man and can actually cause us to move away from Christ. <laughs> now, if you notice everything that I just named, it's something that nobody could ever see on the outside of you. It's something that is in the compartments of your heart. In Song of Solomon chapter 2 verse 15, the writer says, catch the foxes. The little foxes are the ones that spoil the vine. It's the little things that we don't know, the unseen things that we don't know about that actually spoil the vine. It's that jealousy, it's that frustration, it's that anger, it's that place in your heart that you may not know exists that really spoils the vine and keeps us from drawing close to Christ. Seasons of fasting and self-denial help us to allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts with surgical precision. To remove the things that nobody else knows. The psalmist says in Psalms 139, search me, O God, and know my heart, try me, and know my anxieties, and see if there's any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way that is everlasting. Can I tell you, saints, you see that the thing about the heart 
is that it has a lot of hiding places. The heart has a lot of places where things can hide. And none of us will ever know. You might not, might not ever know, but there's places where your heart can hold and hide some things. Yeah. We're going to use this analogy here. This is a briefcase. What do we use briefcases for? We use them to carry stuff. Now, if I were to open this briefcase, come on here, first lady, help me out with this. If I were to open this briefcase, just unzip it. You see, right in the in inside of this briefcase is a bunch of stuff. Actually, my time share stuff, but it's stuff. <laughs> but now, when we look at stuff, these are the surface things of our emotion. Yeah. These are the things that we readily see because it's right there for us. When you're feeling depressed and you're fearful and things are going on in your household, it's bubbling to the surface, it's right there for you. But how many know that every once in a while, you go to other places and compartments? There's a, there's a little compartment here. Oh, I didn't realize that cell phone was in there. If I look over this compartment, I find and see something else, I didn't realize that that was in that little compartment there. I didn't realize that there was a place behind here with a little apartment, a pocket that something could fit. I didn't realize that on the outside of this there was a pocket there and there was some stuff down in there I forgot I had put in there. I've been looking for this business card for hour and I just found it. I didn't realize on this side that there was stuff down here that I didn't realize was down there with some money that I've been looking for. There was compartments that are there. Can I tell you that fasting, thank you. Fasting, the purpose of fasting is not to show you what's readily visible in your heart. It's to help you search the compartments. Hallelujah. Things that you don't know of there. The writer of Jeremiah says that the heart is desperately wicked. Yeah. It's deceitful of all things. Who can know it? The Jeremiah said there are things and compartments in your heart that you would never know exist. Sometimes uh, we don't fast and we don't pray. So what God does is he allows life to happen to expose the compartments. You didn't know that you were still hurt by what sister said, so-and-so said, or brother so-and-so said. But then something happens to bring it to the surface. God exposes that compartment. Sometimes as Christians we think that we have a uh, some kind of monopoly on holiness and salvation. And we think that we got everything together. But can I tell you that 100% of every person sitting here has got a compartment somewhere in their heart where something is there that you don't realize is there. And it is causing you to live the way you're living. And it's coming out in ways and you have no clue why. Yeah. 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 During this time of fasting and prayer that God began to speak to me and say, yes, you're called to be a preacher. Yes, my anointing is upon you. And yes, the mantle of God is upon you. But you need to be more like me. Yeah. Thought that I was doing okay. I'm nice. I give people a kind word. I don't want to return uh, uh, evil for, for evil. I, I think I'm doing good. God said, there's some little things in you that you don't know are there that are existing. And I need to expose those things. It's those things that can keep you separated from me as quick as any outward thing. That's the value. Of fasting and prayer. That's why we consecrate ourselves. Before God. And say God search my heart. We have to search. The compartments of our heart. Those are the things that cause. Our character to decay. God why is it so hard for me to forget. Why is it so difficult for me to connect God. Why is it so difficult for me to love? Why am I so critical? Why do I judge? Why do I doubt? Why do I fear? There's a compartment that has yet to be searched. Hope this is blessing you this way. Self-denial is reflected in the words of the Apostle Paul to the church at Ephesus in chapter 5 verse 1 where he says, Be ye imitators of Christ. We can never imitate Christ unless we deny ourselves. 
share this last thought with you and then I'm going to close. Fasting and prayer. It, it, it helps us to put us in a position, position to get revelation. It enables us to hear the voice of God. Revelation is spiritual understanding not able to be received without divine intervention. Amen. Verses 17 through 20 in this passage, I don't, won't read it. Uh, we read and we see that they were able to gain spiritual understanding and revelation just through fasting. We see in the next chapter that the king had a dream and none of the people could interpret the dream. And God gave Daniel the revelation and he interpreted the dream for the king. Mm -hmm. This is an example of God putting a spotlight on his children. Even in the midst of slavery, he says that even in the midst of this, I'll put the spotlight on you and give you divine revelation. We need God's revelation in order to be effective day to day. Some of us live our lives based off of good ideas and based off of what somebody else has said to us and what makes sense in somebody else's life. Can I tell you that what makes sense for somebody else may make er no earthly sense for you. What's common sense for somebody else may make no good common sense for you. God has called us all to different places and we've got to get a revelation of what he's saying to us in our own individual lives. Yes. God hadn't given some preacher revelation about me. I'd be sitting somewhere wearing the label that I can't learn. If God hadn't given my mother a revelation and my grandmother a revelation about me and my drinking and running the streets, I'd be an alcoholic today. I certainly didn't tell them that I was drinking habitually. But it was divine revelation that was given to them. And they prayed in a spirit of revelation and God delivered me from that. Some of you today are here. If God hadn't sent someone your way with revelation to pray for you, you might still be in your sin. Yeah. Don't ever undervalue the power of divine revelation. Yeah. Some of us are looking for counsel and for some ideas and some formulas to try to fix stuff. When some of us just need to turn our plate down and deny ourselves and seek the face of God and say, God, I don't know which way to turn, whether to go left or to go right, but my eyes are upon you. I am seeking for divine revelation. Now I know the word divine revelation it sounds like this big theological term, this ethereal thing that you can't grab a hold of unless you've been saved for a long time. But divine revelation is what caused you to get saved one day. It's what opened your eyes to your sinfulness and let you know that you needed Jesus. And as you go through your life, it's divine revelation that will keep you. Can I tell you what the world would be like if the children of God would not just just kind of throw caution to the wind and just take chances and do all this different stuff and seek the face of God and say, God, I'm really not sure, but if you speak to me, I know that I'll know your perfect will and we can move by divine revelation. Yeah. Learn that in those times you can play a fasting and prayer. That God was speaking to my heart something that I would otherwise have no way no. I don't know if any of you all have ever experienced that. I'm almost certain you have. It's nothing more pleasant than hearing the voice of God speak to you. In a circumstance that you've been seeking God for clarity. You've been seeking God for wisdom. And you've been saying, God, I don't, I don't get it. What's happening in my life? I don't understand. And the voice of God begins to speak to you. It begins to bring something clear that you otherwise would have never had. I want to challenge you today. Maybe you're a person that says, you know, Pastor, I'm not too much on fasting. I'm not here to condemn you. It's not a legalistic thing. I just want to encourage you and challenge you. Just try it once. Try one meal. Start small. Try something small. By saying, by doing that, you're saying to God, Lord, for this season, maybe this season is two hours, whatever it is, I want to touch heaven. I want heaven to touch me. And I want to experience you in a way that I can't experience unless I turn my heart to 
We're in the, the last leg of our fast. Y'all can say amen. amen. <laughs> last week of our fast. Aren't you glad that for those of you who may not have been fasting, you didn't miss it. You still have time. <laughs> As you know, I'm a professional interviewer by a trade. So I know that y'all was clapping because you didn't want to say amen. <laughs> so I ain't gonna lie and say amen, I'm so clapping. <laughs> when this last week of the fast, I really don't want to challenge you. Don't let this week go by without trying. Try God. Try his methods. You may not see an immediate transformation, but I will assure you. When you use God's equations, you begin, things in the heavens will begin to move. You won't see it with your physical eyes. But God will begin to move things. I encourage you to join me. We're going to be here Friday night for our last corporate prayer for the fast. Come out and be with us. We pray for one hour. We come together. We seek the face of God in one mind. We're believing that God's going to do great things. The last thing I want to challenge you, the Lord spoke to my heart. I believe it was the Holy Spirit as I was sitting there. Before it was time for me to come up to preach. Where Lisa was here receiving the offering. I want to challenge you next week. Bring a sacrificial offering and render it unto God. There's no human thing behind this. I felt the Lord speak to me and say to challenge you. You sow into God. You're praying, you're fasting, and you're giving. That's a combination for success. So into God. I want to challenge you next week. Purpose in your heart. Between you and God. Purpose in your heart. A sacrificial gift that you can give to God. It's not about the church. It's not about any person. It's about you saying, God, I'm giving this to you as a sacrifice. I'm sowing a seed. I'm denying myself. I'm denying myself. You stand to your feet this morning.